model very similarly to the Pasadena example, where there was uh, an acknowledgement that on a spot-by-spot -spot basis that there have been issues in, in the Pasadena Old Town area, and that, in fact, there was a self-assessment of the businesses to, and a commitment by the city also to then establish more parking there. And what a wonderful example of parking in an area that has needed it than Old Town Pasadena. There are many other things that I find a bit, uh, uh, that would lead me to believe that this study might not be necessarily ripe yet, and those are the details of two traffic geeks talking to one another, and I don't know that we need to get into that level of detail. But for the primary reason that I think it's just not granular enough, and that it sets us up to make a decision that it's acceptable to park in, in the neighborhoods, I'm not certain that this is the direction that I'm prepared to take right now. What does granular enough mean? I'm having trouble following that. Um, there were, first of all, the study was conducted at three in 2008. There have been six years of change in this area that aren't reflected here. There are only three particular hours of data that was collected by somebody else. When we look, like I say, at the notion of generating the parking demand here, the entire sum of the parking availability from one end of Corona Del Mar to the other is the uh, denominator over which all that parking is looked at. You know as well as I do that you go out on a Friday night and you try and park around uh, you know, the, the northern side of Corona Del Mar and it's nigh impossible to, to not have to go three blocks deep into the residential area to find that. I think granularity would be, tell me by hour, where are the peaks for particular uses? Break it down and let's look at areas that have high intensity uses or, or active uses, not intense, and let's solve that not spread it out over the entire area where we have blocks where there's engineers and, and uh, other radio parts offices, banks, and that that don't operate during those other times. Let's go down block by block. Uh, Councilman, before we continue, can I speak to some of the, your comments that you brought up? Please. I, I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page, too, about how we use the data and what was involved here. So absolutely, we, we relied on Walker Parking's data collection from 2008 to inform this study. Is it the most contemporary current data? Obviously not, it is six years old. Looking back at the data and from what we've seen in other communities is that 2008 data when it occurred pre-economic bust is relatively close to what it is today. Is it perfect? Absolutely not. And if you wanna conduct an entirely new data, parking data collection process, you can certainly do so. Um, certain elements of the data as well, Corona Del Mar Plaza, we have that in our study, but we're not including it as part of our supply. So that we, we were trying to make that distinction between data that was out there as well as data that we're actually making recommendations on. And we attempted to look at the parking data by zone rather than for the study area as a whole for, for the exact reason that, that you mentioned in terms of not wanting to draw the conclusion that someone can necessarily park in one end of the Corona Del Mar and walk a mile all the way to their car to the other. And there are, and I, and I apologize, I don't feel like I had the time to get into this level of detail tonight, but we do know that, for example, in the northernmost zone, yeah, parking occupancies are higher than they are in, in a lot of the other zones, particularly at certain times of day, like when restaurants are in operation. So some of that data is out there. Can it be more fine-grained and go out and do data collection by the hour? Absolutely, and that will give you more, more information to work with. But, um, and lastly, the last thing I just wanna point out is the, the parking data set in terms of parking going into the neighborhoods. We wanna make clear that we were not assuming as part of the study that somehow that parking is reserved or to be used by the businesses themselves. This is very standard practice in parking studies to look a couple blocks off the main street, though, to try to figure out, is there spillover parking going on? So both from the data that we saw, as well as from the stakeholders, it found out that it looks like, yeah, there are probably employees who are parking in the residential neighborhoods. Um, so we wanted to be able to make that determination. We weren't necessarily making a statement, though, that that parking should be utilized for employee parking. 
Um, we just want to be able to analyze it and see how it was being used currently. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Councilman Curry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, well, I guess I'm a little underwhelmed as well as Mr. Petros. And my concern is that I've heard from some of the property owners who own these lots, and they are substantially less enthused about the shared parking concepts than I think perhaps we're letting people think they are. Uh, it's their lots, and they have the ability now, as I think we pointed out, to make these kind of arrangements with the various other businesses if they want to use the lots for shared parking. Uh, and they're very concerned about government policy that sort of meddles and tells them what to do or how to do it and who to do it with and all these kinds of things, in addition to the concerns about liability uh, insurance and, and ongoing uh, tort liability for people who have accidents while they're on their lots because we opened them up and said, go park in Mr. Smith's lot because we think it's a good idea. So it's easy to solve a problem. You can use somebody else's assets and resources to do it, but I'm just not sure that that's a very effective public policy for what this is, and I'm not sure we're ready for prime time yet with this report. Mayor. Councilman Selage. Yeah, the one thing that, uh, I shouldn't say the one thing, but one of the things that uh, that I'm somewhat concerned about is I understand the blended rate concept, and I've seen that used in other older areas where there is uh, an abundance of on-street parking that you don't typically have in a, in a new shopping center. And uh, But typically those are used for your by-right uses, but when you get into where you need conditional use permits where extra parking is required, particularly for restaurants, I start having a problem you know, understanding how that uh, how that's really going to work and how that uh, how that ends up being a uh, a fair distribution of the parking burden, if you if if you will. And you said that there's some city that you worked with that you just started doing this in that it's turned out to be very successful. Yeah, I mean we've made these sorts of. Tell me what city that is? Oh, well, the one that, the example I was giving is a much larger example in Sacramento, but we have done the same similar work in Ventura. We've done similar work in other Bay Area cities. Um, the size of the city doesn't matter, and I definitely hear what you're saying, though. Your same concern was voiced at the Planning Commission hearing, in ter specifically in terms of restaurants. Um, and this is something that, and we stated at the Planning Commission, you can change these code. Right now we have it set at two per thousand. Some communities have actually taken their blended rates and said, well, we'll have a two per thousand for, rest uh, for general retail and a different requirement for restaurants. The fact is, though, that restaurants tend to peak only at certain times of the day and the rest of the day it's actually very empty um, so if you have an evening peaking restaurant they tend to actually have increased demand when there are fewer cars um, in the neighborhood does that mean that restaurants should automatically have the same requirement as a retail maybe not and that's a community priority decision um, realizing that as you increase that minimum parking requirement for restaurants um, you are making it more difficult for them to enter, and you might not necessarily be solving the parking problem because supply is ultimately not your issue. Okay, well, another another question for you, and I, I don't know if I quite understand how this works, but uh, the way you presented the program, so let's say we have two commercial commercial lots. So lot A, the, um, uh, the building owner tears his building down, and he builds, uh, builds a new building, and he parks on site at, uh, at two per thousand. The gentleman next door to him has a building, and he sees what his neighbor has done, and he's got a building that's parked at four per thousand, and he said, well, geez, I sh would like to uh, increase my, uh, my square footage, and I can get more square footage and get rid of uh, two per thousand of my parking spaces and uh, build a bigger building, take away parking from the parking supply. Is that how that this is going to work, that someone would be able to do that, or does he... Is he not able to do that? He has to keep his four per thousand, but his neighbors parked at uh, two per thousand. Well, the idea here was that, and typically what we've seen in some of these other communities is that a lot of property owners won't want to demolition the entire building, but they will want to repurpose those spaces. So, for example, if you have a parking lot and you say, hey, under this new requirement, um, I have five or ten parking spaces that I used to need under my old code. Under the new code, I don't need them. as I, I know they're empty. That's possible. The person also could take a look at it and say, you know what, I know these 10 spaces are completely used all the time and I'm not going to touch them. But if someone did, then yeah, they could actually be ended up turning into, as I mentioned earlier, you could have outdoor restaurant seating, you could have planting there, you could have a whole host of different things occupying that space. Um, so do we have any idea how many potential parking spaces we could lose by people doing that? 
and what impact that would have on the overall parking supply? Uh, we don't have that number. We did a different analysis where we actually looked at several of the lots in the area, and we assumed that all those lots simply disappeared and were redeveloped. Um, and under that analysis, we found that even, well, in addition to that, also building out to the maximum allowable square footage is district-wide, um, which I've been informed by staff is highly unlikely. Um, but that even under that scenario, there would still be sufficient parking supply to be able to handle it. Now, would there still continue to be these areas of high demand? Absolutely, if you just kind of let things run the way they do. Councilman Han. Yeah, I guess I'd, I'd have to say I, too, am a little underwhelmed by the extensiveness of the uh, recommendations here. I, when I hear complaints about parking in Corona del Mar, it seems like it's mostly involved with the northern end of Corona del Mar. And so I agree that a more granular solution approach would be appropriate here, it seems to me. Was there Was there serious consideration along the way of instituting some amount of uh, metered parking along the lines of the uh, Walker, you know, 85% targeted available, you know, usage. And then then that makes it off-street parking a more viable solution if, uh, if you can combine that with the residential permit and specific lots that are less, you know, price lower that do attract mm. people to park to. Absolutely, and I hear what you're saying. It's um, We did consider meters. It was one of the long-term strategies. From the data that we see on East Coast Highway is that there really isn't enough demand right now to justify putting in meters. That said, one of the things that we also state in the study is that those numbers might appear artificially low because you have one-hour time limits in effect. So people aren't parking there because they want to stay for two hours, and so they'll simply instead parking from someone else's home. So parking meters are certainly an option that are on the table. We just felt that you needed to make some other changes first. So let's say you do go to two hours and all of a sudden all those spaces fill up. Then you might say, hey, yeah, okay, this makes sense to do some meters now. But we didn't feel it was quite um, the right timing for it quite yet. But absolutely, if you want to do – if you the, some of the best way to manage parking is to have residential permits, meters, and things of that sort. Now, those come with all their own – you know, considerations too, but it will definitely, I think, resolve a lot of the problems you're you're referencing. I, I think I, it I, does. I think it does give you the ability to be more granular in your approach if you're w willing to open yourself up to those kinds of solutions. Mm -hmm. Council Wogan, Councilwoman Dago, do you have any comment you'd like to make? I have a question. You mentioned the Pasadena um, example from a parking um, perspective. What makes that so successful? What co underlying concepts are they using, and, and which of those could really be applied in our community to, in this particular context? Um, well, I don't. I'm happy to talk about Pasadena, although I think it was one of the council. Yeah, it was Councilman Petros who actually brought it up. Um, so, Pas and I don't know, Councilman, if you want to speak to this at all. Okay. Um, there's a few things that Pasadena does, um, and that they do it very well. Um, and it changed back in the early '80s. I'd like to say. Um, the problem that they were having at the time, what they were really trying to, one of the key things they were trying to solve from a parking standpoint was the fact that a lot of their on-street spaces were being occupied by employees um, who were occupying a lot of the prime on-street spaces and not allowing customers to come. Now, granted, the, dis the district down there had a whole host of other issues. I'm just simply focusing on parking right now. So the decision was made to put in parking meters to encourage that level of turnover and take and return all those revenues to the generating district. Simultaneously, they also made other improvements. So they worked with um, private off-street lot owners to open up their lots, particularly during the evening. Um, they had some big problems at night with people coming and trying to frequent restaurants and things of that sort and simply parking back in the neighborhoods. And they were able to work with some of the larger lot owners and say, let's open up these lots and you can park there. And again, you know, I'm sure not every lot owner they approached was amenable to it, but it clearly worked to a certain degree. Um, and that's kind of, I think, helped helped the area over time. I'd like to open this up to public uh, comments at this point in time. Thank you very much for the presentation. And uh, is there anyone from the public that would like to make comment on uh, this uh, topic during the study session?
Keep in mind, this is the study session portion. We're not going to make any decisions at this point in time. That'll come later, I guess, this uh, evening. But uh, for comments on the study session, uh, that belongs to the previous presenter. Just one of notes here. Bernie Svalstad, uh Mr. Mayor and Council from the Business Improvement District, the Chairman. The major problem in Conomar, and this, this study does pick out, and the Walker study did in this study, does pick out the prime three or four areas in Corona Mar that we have a problem with. We have a problem near Marguerite and PCH. We have a problem up near MacArthur and PCH, near the Port Theater, and uh, one, one or two other areas. And, and this study did detail like those areas that he didn't really get into in significant detail. The other flaw in, in my opinion with the Walker study and what he mentioned is when they say you have plenty of parking as they go back a block or more in the residential area and they count that as commercial parking. I don't think that's uh, the greatest uh, way to do it, but because uh, it looks like we have more parking than we do. The thing we're trying to get at in this study and solve the problems is, number one, everybody in Corona Mar says, how can we have to have all these banks? Why are all the banks here? Why do we have this kind of thing? We're trying to get something for a 10 or 20 year plan that will vitalize and revitalize Corona Mar. We don't want it just to be all a bunch of service buildings there that doesn't bring income into the city like it should and uh, develop in a prosperous way and all the buildings they can't rebuild because of the code. And uh, the experts, one of our experts isn't here tonight, maybe he'll be here later uh, in regard to this, but the point about it is we need to have some revitalization and code assistance in Corona Mar to allow better kinds of businesses uh, so that we can broaden it. Problem is now, and Jim will come talk about that, but the, the businesses have to pay a fortune for off-street parking in a lot of cases. It's quite a bit of ways. We have identified some lots that are near uh, the northern area, I call it northern, I call it western, but part of Corona Mar, and uh, there is possibilities, and theoretically, if uh, we're able to get funds from development fees from uh, up in uh, Fashion Island or some other place, that there are ways to pick up some lots in some areas, like they've done in some of these other cities, to help the parking in these hot spots. And so this, we need to have this help or Corona Mar is not going to, in the next 5, 10, 15 years, going to develop and it's just going to degenerate. So uh, right now, the basic problems are the fact that employees and, and the residents bought into this too because a lot of the employees, no matter what you tell them, go park, I'm up, go park in the uh, residential areas. Thank you. But this does take into the hot spots, uh, Tony. Uh, this does specify the, the different areas, not just a broad brush. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good afternoon. Jim Walker, the bungalow, also um, bid member and uh, involved in the parking study. You know, one of the things that um, I think the feeling from the um, council is when we talk about lowering the uh, parking requirements, it's kind of counterintu counterintuitive, and I understand that. But try and understand where we are now. And the, and the parking requirements we have now, frankly, in my opinion, just breed inefficiency. And the reason I say that is, frankly, uh, there's many uh, properties out there, restaurants, that are in violation of the parking code. They do not adhere to it. Uh, they're not penalized for that. Um, and the reason it breeds inefficiency is because there's a uh, culture that in order to satisfy your parking requirement, you have to grab parking wherever you can. And it's become very expensive. It's not readily available. Um, frankly, I have parking 
to satisfy the city all the way on Avocado in the uh, Wells Fargo building. Do I use it? Frankly, no. It's not really uh, conducive. My valet guys are here today. They can tell you. Um, but I have it because that's required. There's a lot right behind me that's, uh, frankly, uh, under the control of another restaurant. Do they use it? No. But they have it. They have it because they're trying to satisfy the parking requirement. And so what happens is you have these lots, and they might satisfy the requirement, but frankly, they're not being used. So during peak periods, when we have lots of cars coming into our neighborhood, there's plenty, there are parking spaces, but they're not being utilized. We're not us utilizing the parking that's available uh, efficiently. So if we were to lower the parking requirement, I think it would free up some of these lots that are not being used. We would not be held hostage by the lot owners. Uh, I think that it would level the playing field, very frankly, uh, for the rest of the community. And the other thing that Bruni spoke to, which I agree with, is what's happening is because of how the uh, demographics are and, and the way the businesses are starting to settle in, we have a lot of banks, we have a lot of workout studios in Crown Mar. So if you look at the business mix, it's really um, kind of getting out of balance. And there isn't really a, an incentive or a way for commercial to come in and comply with parking requirements. So all you have is a very limited field to uh, comply with the parking. And so consequently, it's limiting, I think, our, our, our diversity within that community. It's not solving the parking as it stands right now. The parking code as it stands now, obviously, is not solving the parking problem. And so consequently, I think that it would be helpful to lower that parking standard, lower the code, allow other businesses to come in, uh, open up some of those parking spaces that are not being utilized, and take away uh, us being held hostage. Anyway, that's my comment. Thank you very much. Can I ask staff a question real quick? No, staff. Oh, what's staff. the parking requirement for a bank, and what's the parking requirement for general retail? Bank and retail are one per 250. So they're oh. the same? Yes. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Is there anyone else in the public that would like to speak on this topic? All right, then I would just like to make a couple of comments and we'll move on to the next agenda item. It seems to me that, that in an academic sense anyway, that when we go through these kinds of analysis and we determine that there is, maybe not the right word, adequate, but there is sufficient parking, uh, but it's not where you want it, when you want it, uh, that, that there should be some way to try to balance that. Since it's all private owned, or the majority of it's private owned, I don't think there's any of us that set up here that, are, that have any kind of desire at all to tell these people what they need to do. Uh, but if we know of, of incentives that could be offered, uh, and um, uh, that, that, that if you did participate uh, voluntarily, that the insurance would be picked up by the city or the, the city has a blanket insurance policy, and I'm making this stuff up as I go, but, but you know, what kind of incentives exist that would cause private individuals to say, I mean, I own a lot at the beach, and I don't, you know, I don't let just anybody come and park in it uh, because of liability, because of cleaning it up constantly, uh, these different types of things. If, if those types of things became incentives, then maybe I might have an interest in saying, well, you know, a restaurant across the street, maybe they could use it or that type of thing. So I think to look for those things is important. What I hear from colleagues here is that not enough data was presented to convince anybody that that, that kind of incentive program has been identified at this point in time. And, um, and so we'll see what uh, happens during the discussion this afternoon. But uh, uh, to me, offering some kind of incentives, even though that might cost the city something, might be a lot less costly than buying property and building parking facilities and parking structures. So just no conclusion, just some thoughts. And with that, I'll call for SS3. Someone to fetch Nancy. Oh, here she comes. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, if you see people up here squinting, 
we're not disagreeing with you. It's just that there's a reflection coming off of that wall over there that, that number one, causes us to squint, and number two, we can't see your face when you're up here at the dais. So we hope you're not growling at us. So <laughs> Please. Mayor Hill, members of the City Council, um, back to parking, but different geography, uh, Balboa Village. Uh, it is a little distinctly different than Corona Del Mar. Most of the parking down in Balboa Village is publicly controlled, as you well know. Um, I wanted to kind of start by talking about where we've been and, 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 and get into some of the parking strategies pretty quickly. Uh, we've done a variety of public outreach. This dates back to 2011, 2012 with the uh, Neighborhood Revitalization Committee, the Citizens Advisory Panel. Uh, it helped shape the Balboa Village Master Plan that was adopted in 2012. Um, since then, we've been working on refining the parking strategies as well as the other strategies that are in that document um, and with the help of the uh, BVAC committee. Um, parking management, so we're really just bringing forward those initiatives out of the, uh, the, the master plan for parking. Um, we really kind of categorized it into two different areas. Uh, we've got the Balboa Village uh, area, which is in orange, and we have the residential neighborhood to the west of that um, in yellow, or green, I guess it might be. And what we're proposing, um, is, again, these are initiatives out of the master plan, but we've refined them and we're ready to bring them forward for implementation, um, is in the village area, we're looking at a parking management district, and we would be looking at modifying the parking codes there, modifying the meter rates, uh, to incentivize people to park where we would like them to, which are in the big, large uh, municipal lots. Uh, change timing of the meters as well um, and provide a, a voluntary employee parking program and the like. Now, the area to the west, we're looking at trying to control the spillover effects of parking that are occurring in the, these areas. Uh, residents have uh, complained uh, over the, in the past about you know, commercial parkers in that area. Uh, we're looking for a way to control that, and so the code does have a provision for a resident parking permit program that would, is also part of the program. Can you point out a few uh, landmarks so people know what it is that are watching from home? Oh, uh, it's not absolutely. Just orange and green. Um, the village is uh, defined as the A Street on the east, or on the right side of the the, 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 the the graphic, and then Adams Street, which is the dividing line there. So it's A Street to Adams Street, Bay to this to the ocean. And so it, the residential parking permit program would be from Adams Street all the way to 7th Street, which is on the far western edge. Uh, there's a line down the middle there, and I'll get to that momentarily, but uh, basically we're looking to implement the program over the entire area, but start in, uh, enforcement of the resident parking permit program in, just in the eastern portion of that zone, only to Island Avenue. Into some of those details, uh, as I said, there is the, uh, uh, the area Adams to 7th Street, um, it would include Bay Island and the moorings that are right offshore. You'll notice that that, that, that map, if I go back to it, um, included the moorings over here. Phase one, uh, Island Avenue to Adams Street, and that would include the island and the moorings. Phase two, Island to 7th Street. So what this is is an overnight parking permit program. The hours that are being proposed by the BVAC is 4 p.m. to 9 a.m. daily. And so basically this would allow residents the ability to come home uh, in the evening to find, potentially find a parking place. Um, and, and if you have those permits, they could park there and they wouldn't get cited. Uh, but those folks who um, may be coming in there to the village and are, you know, in essence, finding free parking rather than the paid parking in the village um, um, during at least that four to six hour time period, this will incentivize them to park into the village when the parking studies show in the vast amount of time we have adequate parking down there. Um, now, during the summer months and the weekend when the weather is uh, good, there's never going to be enough parking. We all recognize that. But again, what our, the goal of this is, is to try to better manage the parking resources that we have before we step into to acquiring additional uh, land or, or creating parking structures. Um, so we've got uh, permits for household, uh, four per household, annual guest part passes. Um, it, creating this program is really going to be reliant upon a, 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 an online database, if you will, to, to do this effectively to get guest passes for the day. The technology is there. Uh, enforcement through license plate recognition. Now, you know, we're, we're hearing a variety of different comments from the public. Uh, some folks are saying the area is too large. Some folks are saying that it, you know, the time isn't correct. Some people are saying that we maybe should look at this seasonally. Um, so th those are the types of comments that we're getting. And th th one of the major comments we're also getting is that people are, they don't particularly want to have to pay for these parking permits to park on a public street when they don't have to pay today. 
in the, in the report, I kind of rec recognize that we look at it a little bit differently. You know, we're looking at this system as a way to cover the cost of administering the parking permit program, in essence, to free up some spaces that are now being used by folks who should be parking in the village. And so in order to do that, to free up those spaces for the residents overnight, for their guests and, and, and their families, um, is, is to implement a program that costs money. And so we're going to have to charge at least a modest fee. We'd want to obviously keep that as low as possible. Uh, in order to, to, to get some folks to park where we'd like them to. Um, so that's the basic resident parking permit program. Uh, I also want to stress we did a survey uh, where we sent out over 1,100 uh, mailers, and we got a very high return rate, over 35%, um, and over 60% of those folks were, 68%, uh, it's in the report specifically, were in support of the program. And that's one of the tests and the findings uh, to establish a resident permit program is, is there has to be some support in the community. And we do feel that we have that. So um, if there's any questions about the resident permit program, I'm happy to take them now. Um, I can then start talking about Baba Village and the parking management plan that's being also proposed. Questions, uh, comments? Just that I, I do agree we got a, a comment letter about, or the Planning Commission did, about Babel Island. And I think that any kind of permit parking thing is going to push people more to park on the Balboa Island, particularly those who would ordinarily park overnight uh, because it's free. They don't have to pay either for the parking lot, uh, the commercial parking lot, the public parking lot. So I do think that's something that needs to be considered, just what the impact will be on, on Balboa Island, particularly the area around the ferry. Okay. Any other comments by council? Yeah, I think it's important that we hear the uh, the commercial piece of it too, because this is really a, a kind of a holistic approach to parking in the overall area, and I, I think it's hard to just single out a, a piece of it. All right. Absolutely. Um, okay, I'll go ahead and move on to the village parking management district. Again, this is that area between um, A Street and Adams Street. It's just the commercial district. There are some residential uses in that area as well. Um, Key here is we want to create this shared parking district where we hope to have people come, park once, have a variety of different uh, um, destinations, if you will. We want to incentivize folks to use the parking when it's available uh, rather than parking for free in the residential areas nearby. Um, and we want one of the goals of the overall plan is to help revitalize this area. And, and as you heard from uh, uh, Mr. Canepa earlier, you know, the parking requirements are a disincentive to reinvesting back in those buildings. And so in this particular area, we're looking to eliminate the parking requirements for all the major uses, with the exception of a few. Uh, the, some of the uses that require a lot of parking, um, cultural institutions, uh, meeting uh, assembly halls and the like, um, and the marina uses would not, uh, they would have to provide the parking. Um, but your basic retail building could <laughs> change hands from a retail to an office to a service use to potentially a restaurant. Um, and I, I think the key there is is that we eliminate this regulatory impediment to revitalizing and reusing those existing buildings. Now, other, other market forces are going to be uh, brought to bear as to whether somebody wants to make that investment and change those uses. Uh, but if indeed they do make those changes, uh, we believe we can bring in a, a larger mix of tenants, maybe a few small restaurants, and they can serve their visitors who are already there parking in the lots uh, today. A um, couple of other aspects of this, the uh, voluntary permit parking program, uh, you know, it, it is a difficult proposition to start to require employees to park in certain places. Again, it's a voluntary program. Uh, what we'd like to do is to create some designated places where employees can park uh, there might be a small fee for that, but we have to provide an incentive to have them park there because in some cases it may be less convenient for that employee to get to their destination. But we'd really want to try to keep them from parking in the residential areas, and that's really the whole point of this. Um, so that's part of the parking management plan. We do have some in-loop parking fees paid for nine businesses, and, and, and one of the things we want to do is if we're going to start eliminating parking requirements, we want to try to level the playing field for all these businesses. So nine businesses right now pay a fee. Uh, it's a very nominal amount. Uh, it's about $13,000 a year that the city collects. Uh, but we're looking to suspend that program for those nine businesses. And the large, a large component of this is to start modifying the meter rates in the area and to actually incentivize their use when they're available. And what we're finding, the data shows, is that we have a lot of free parking spaces down there in the wintertime, and we charge for that. And what happens there is, is then the people will look for the free parking, they park in the residential area. So we, the hope is, is if we lower those rates, 
we're going to get people to park in the metered lots, and then, which is then hopefully closer to the uh, businesses that they're going to, and therefore freeing up some parking in the neighborhood streets. And so uh, we're looking at changing those metered rates uh, on the streets and in the off-street lots. Uh, two other components, commercial two-hour validation. We're going to look to change those rates rather than having an hour. We're going to go two hours because we've, we discovered that uh, uh, people will need to stay just a little bit longer so that they can maybe do two or three visits down there as opposed to just a single one within an hour. Um, and then to get residents down there, uh, we want to provide a, a, a parking discount in the, in the village in the off-season so residents could purchase a, uh, a, a pass and park down in the village for free and so that might incentivize residents to come down to that area and make a quick trip, visit some of the shops, um, and help kind of spur economic activity in the off-season. So those are the basic components here. Um, I think the biggest one, which may seem, as, as we heard from the prior discussion, eliminating the parking requirements may seem counterintuitive. But again, as I said, uh, uh, you know, people are going to make uh, decisions, and when they've got parking uh, requirements that have to be met, you know, uh, you know not having that impediment, you know, they're still going to look at other market forces. Are they going to be able to serve their visitors effectively, and even if they don't have parking? And, you know, and in, and in small urban enclaves, uh, serviced by mass transit and these large public lots, you've got a lot of visitors coming to the area, and so not every lot needs to have its own parking because they do rely heavily upon the, the metered lots. Um, and so it may seem counterintuitive, but again, this is eliminating what I consider a regulatory constraint to, to redevelopment and reinvestment back into the property. And, Jim, and so, to underscore one of the points you're making, in the previous example, we were using as many as 1,500 residential parking spaces to arrive at that blended rate. In this example, there are no residential spaces that would be affected by the change here because of the partnership of the RP3 and this strategy. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and, and to Hen Mr. Hen's point, um, you know, these two areas, they work together in concert. It's a holistic approach, and so when you start to make changes in the village, you might see some folks trying to spill out into the residential areas, and, this, and the resident parking permit program then helps incentivize folks to go back into the village where we want them to park, where the parking is available. And I think to Councilmember uh, Gardner's uh, question, uh, yes, we're going to see um, on the edges of these districts, you know, a little squeeze out of parking, and so we're going to have to monitor this. And that's what staff is committed to doing is to looking at this and making adjustments as we need to go forward. So if we are seeing uh, a, a parking impact that, that's now being maybe kind of pushed into the island, we're going to have to look at that area carefully and maybe come up with some different rules for parking in and around the ferry. I don't expect a lot of people to be going over there because there's not a lot of parking spaces and it is inconvenient to cross the ferry, but, but I understand to your point, uh, we need to monitor these edges and, and then make adjustments as we go forward as, as, as the public adjusts to how um, the new regulations work. We'll apologize to the Beak family on your behalf of noting that it's inconvenient to use the ferry, but... Um, <laughs> um, Thank you. What does staff, what would staff like from the council? Certainly your comments that uh, you've provided a number of them now, the public's comments, and then uh, our recommended action is that if you think this is ready for prime time to set that for a public hearing in October. I have a question before we get into real comments. It says um, uh, two additional charges are proposed. First, a two-hour commercial validation program. Would that be uh, operated by the businesses? That's something that they would do? Or is that something that the city is going to underwrite? We haven't actually talked about how it would be underwritten or even if it needs to be underwritten. Um, I, I think the, the purpose there is, is that it helps incentivize folks for coming in and making a quick trip into the village. They could get it, their ticket stamped. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure the exact mechanism, but we'd like to offer that to incentivize, you know, small quick trips down into the village by residents or visitors to, to help no, incentivize. I, I, I have no problem area. with validation programs, but it does seem something that, that the businesses should get together and do and not the city. I think the issue here was to provide the mechanism for a validation program and then to work out, you know, who's going to pay for it. Um, but, but the main thing is to have the mechanism in place. All right. I'd like to offer the public to make comment on this uh, agenda item. Anyone of the public like to make comment on the Balboa Village parking concept? My name is Joyce Faye Barnes, and I live at 122 East Bay Avenue uh, on the peninsula near the library. And I live in a house that was made in 1917 or before. 
So, of course, there's no parking place. How many people had cars in 1917? We were going into World War I. So anyhow, I bought this house with another teacher in the district, and I lived there. But I'd like for you to take a fantasy trip into the future with me for a minute. Let's go someplace in the future. Let's go to a cemetery. Let's look at a headstone. It says, here lies Joyce. She lived in his house over 40 years with no parking place. She had on-street parking. She was a great parallel parker, and she was a happy camper. And she was especially happy when the city council back in 19, in 2014 voted to eliminate the entire thought of a residential parking permit. May she rest in peace. That's a very big headstone, but uh, we thank you for your comment. Is there anyone else in the public like to comment on it? And has the nerve to follow her? <laughs> um, Campbell, I'm sorry, I'm the PowerPoint presentation. My name is Deanna Schnabel. I live at 306 Fernando Street, and I'm two blocks west of the Balboa Fun Zone. Um, I agree and um, endorse the improvements to the Balboa Fun Zone um, that Councilman Hen has been spearheading, and I appreciate the efforts to improve parking as well, with one caveat. Um, and that is the elimination of the parking regulations um, before we have a permit program in place and um, also the expansion of the Explore Ocean uh, area. I, need, I have a short period, so let me run through this real quick. Um, we are an older neighborhood, as um, Joyce indicated. Um, we have many properties that do not have garages, but this is what we deal with during the summer. Um, I live uh, just a few blocks from this area, and we are dealing with uh, uh, fishermen and Catalina Flyer people regularly. The expansion of Explorer Oceans threatens to take our summer congestion into a year-round congestion issue. Um, if I understand correctly, Explorer Ocean uh, intends to uh, operate every day but Sunday or one day out of the week. Um, and so their target is to have 407 guests um, per day um, when they are open. And so that is consistent with what we're seeing with Catalina Flyer and the fishing vessel, uh, vessels. So the parking program is necessary um, just to make ensure we have some sort of quality of life. It is permissible in our area because of the available uh, public parking. Uh, if you look at those communities that have parking programs in place, they are approved by the Coastal Commission strictly, be strictly because of the availability of uh, parking lots. The public cannot be displaced or banned from um, the public beach. Um, over the years, consultants have recommended um, parking permit programs, um, and so we're just in agreement with them. The recommendation um, in front of you includes uh, including the boat mooring owners um, in the effort. That would entitle them to four parking permits, just like those people who own homes here. Um, our group doesn't think that that is um, a good idea. Uh, we have some people in our area who use vehicles as storage, and that would allow them to use more vehicles for storage. Any questions? Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else in the public that would like to speak? My name is Michelle Silver, and I know a few of you. I've sent letters to a couple of the different people on this committee. Uh, my husband and I have owned our home for 36 years. We live directly in front of Bay Island. Uh, this entire year has been a very long year with tremendous amounts of work going on to rebuild Bay Island structural damage. Um, I think the majority of people who live in Balboa, especially in the area that you have shown, the problems that we really suffer from the most never occur between the hours of 4 p.m. and 9 a.m. 
when we suffer from parking difficulties is during the day. Obviously, when it's summer months, when it's warm months, we never have enough parking on Balboa Peninsula and never have. I've been in Balboa since I was two years old, and when we have tremendous amounts of traffic, obviously there is not sufficient parking, whether it's in front of our streets or down in the municipal parking lot. I can't, I, what I would really like to ask each and every one of you that sits on this committee is where you live and would you want to pay to park on the street in front of your house? It's very simple. The other question would be if you plan on having any type of entertainment at your home, would you want to be limited to four cars being able to come and park near your house? I just find that to be absolutely inconceivable, and the majority of people that I've asked say the same thing. So if you're going to consider doing that to the area between 7th Street and Adams, then I think you should consider the entire city of Newport Beach. Do it to Balboa Island. I'm sorry if they would be affected, but we're affected daily. Do it to Corona Del Mar. All those homes you were talking about that are off of Coast Highway, make them I just can't see that you could do something discriminatory to one particular area as though that's going to resolve our parking issues, but they are not from 4 p.m. until 9 a.m. in the morning. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the public that would like to comment? My name is Jim Stratton. Um, I'm a resident in the affected area. Uh, I want to thank the staff for doing a great job on addressing some of the uh, complaints and problems that uh, have already been brought up about, about costs and so on and so forth. Um, resident parking has always been an issue in the area west of the village. Uh, contrary to other people's opinion, uh, our best friends lived on Montero Street in the 70s and 80s and uh, 40 years ago, and we used to come down and visit them all the time. Our son caught his first fish off uh, right in between uh, Bay Island and the peninsula. Um, and every time we came down there, I don't care whether it was uh, uh, during the day or in the evening, uh, it was always a hassle trying to find a parking place, always a hassle. Um, Intensification uh, of demand looms tall in our area, and that's something that I think people don't realize, uh, uh, that um, Explore Ocean is um, going to exponentially make this uh, situation worse um, if village revitalization is successful. People cruising around looking for parking places, um, a late night bar crowd coming down the street uh, doing unmentionable things in people's yards. Um, you know, it's it's ridiculous. I, I, I can hardly believe people can't see that. But anyway, besides that, multiple professional parking consultants have um, recommended parking relief, residential parking relief for our particular area. It's a unique area. It's not the same as West Balboa. It's not the same as Balboa Island. They don't have the crowd uh, that comes to the beach. Um, if, if residents are worried about runaway parking fees, I've heard, you know, uh, $20 is going to turn into $60. Put a limit on it. Put a cap on it, something like uh, Prop 13. Um, let's try it. Uh, as we've heard from Ms. Schnabel, um, resident permit parking has been used in multiple cities. It's not a new concept, and it's been very successful, and the people love it. Um, RP3 can be reevaluated in two to three years, and that's something that I would recommend that would be added into this whole package, and it is a whole package. It it's all has to work together. Reevaluate it in two or three years. If it doesn't work, get rid of it. I realize there's some capital expenditures and signs and so forth, but uh, it, it doesn't have to be set in concrete. Once you pass it, it's there forever. Um, that's all I had to say today. Thank you. Thank you. Is anyone else that would like to speak on this topic?
How many more speakers do we have on this topic? Could you come on down to the holy mackerel? Come on down to the front row and uh -oh. <laughs> line up and please begin. Yeah, good evening, Council. My name is Andrew Michelli. I live at 308 Montero, and I kind of disagree with the findings of the report, which is items one, two, and three substantially and regularly interfere. I've lived there over 20 years, and I think three times in those 20 years, I've not been able to come home and find parking on my street. And I think the report is kind of slanted towards, uh, they use the word incentivize, but it's really forcing people to use the paid parking, which benefits, of course, the owners of those lots where people would rather not pay. And it seems it's going to, at the detriment of us homeowners having to have the permit and pay for it. And I don't think it, I think it's kind of nasty, actually, of the city, because there's families that come down. I watch them all the time. They park, they get the little kids, they go to the beach for the day, they have a nice time, and they come back. And I think the city owes that respect to the public, not just a bunch of residents that want convenient parking on their street, because we all pay taxes, we all go to other neighborhoods and use their neighborhood, and we aren't charged. So it just I just don't agree with it, and I think we should not do it. And that's the end of my comment. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Debbie R. Dildy, I don't know how many times I've been before the city council here since 65 talking about parking in the Newport Beach area or the Balboa area. I built five duplexes, 1965-66, in the 300 block. Today, I am the, in between Bay Avenue and Balboa. I'm the only property owner that resides in his own place. Our alleys were not paved until 74. There are currently 20 legal non-conforming structures with no parking. There are several others that have non-conforming garages because they were built for Model T's and Model A's. They're used for storage. There isn't enough parking places on Balboa Boulevard and Bay Avenue to take care of our own, just our own family, our own block. The problem when we got involved in this, as I recall, I'm sure uh, Council Member Hen was kind enough to get us down this path, is when the Economic Development uh, Committee came and proposed adding meters to what was then she thought considered the bid, which I lived in at the time. That was just the 300, 400 block of uh, Balboa Boulevard. They came out with a map that showed, because of the definition in the code that to Coronado, they had proposed meters from Coronado Ocean to the bay back over to Adams Street. And that's what, why I feel we're here today is to resolve this problem. I'll admit, in 65, I knew I was in a proposed and took a chance on building residential units in a commercial zone. I had to get uh, a use permit to do it. But over the years, it was right. It's all gone. The only thing there is uh, really is the telephone company building, which is a public facility. And the only thing that might be some protection to us uh, in a case of a tsunami that <laughs> diverts some water. But something's got to be done. It's, 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 it's absolutely ridiculous. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, Bill, um, are you in favor of a residential permit program? Definitely, but I, I think okay. it could be finding in a stepping stone. I think maybe it's gone a little too far, but to have that area, because there's positively going to be push people down the street. But the, all, all weekend, I was covered with Catalina Flyer people, uh, and I said, see them park there Friday morning and come back late Sunday night. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, please. 
Richard Dorn. I'm a mooring permit holder with a level board permit for many years. Uh, I believe the parking permits are a good idea. It would be nice if they could be extended into daylight hours. However, I'm sure the Coastal Commission would not go along with that, so it looks like we're going to be stuck with the hours that we have. As far as permit holders getting the same number of permits, people that rent uh, apartments in the buildings that have no parking places, they're going to be qualified for as many permits as everyone else, and we should be treated as others. I have myself and another person living aboard. We have two vehicles, so we need two, two places to park. Uh, I have a van that's never parked there. I'd never have more than the vehicles that are used on a daily basis parked there. There's never been a vehicle stored there that belonged to me. And there never will be because it's not necessary and it takes up <coughs> parking that could be better utilized. So I just request that the mooring permit holders be treated as the rest of the residences in the area. As far as permits for the permit hold, uh, mooring permit holders, uh, very few people that have mooring permits, stay overnight with their vessels. Very few people take their boats out for a weekend or even for a day. The majority of the boats are on the mooring. They never leave the moorings. Maybe 20% of the boats are used, and less than that would be parked on the streets overnight anytime. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Excuse me. Name's Ken Gorn. Uh, mooring permit holder in the C section, and I just want to fervently ask you guys to treat us like the re the uh, residents about the number of permits. I'm all for that program of permits, and uh, we do pay taxes. Uh, I think that a lot of them people in the residents think that we're derelicts or something, but uh, we pay. They tripled our taxes out there, our fees. Uh, on a 40-foot mooring, I paid about 2000 this year, plus we do our own maintenance, and we don't rent those moorings out. We aren't allowed to. So um, I ask you to treat us like the residents. So, Thank you. It. Bless you. Thank you very much. My name is Howard Hall. Uh, I've lived in... Uh, Balboa since 1945. Uh, I'm a property owner. Um, I also uh, live within the uh, parking, residential parking management area. And it, it seems like it's being portrayed as some kind of a homogeneous area where people agree that, that this is a good thing overall which is furthest from the truth. As you get further and further away from Adams Street, you get less and less support. Now, you do get some support on the, on the bay front because they don't even have a curb, and they would love to have some special privileges curbside. But generally, it gets less and less support. So in the East Newport area that I've proposed from Medina Way up to 7th Street, it, 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 it That's does not, not it, 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 the people there that I've talked to, a lot of them, that would like me to speak for them and say, no, up there we don't need a program. We never have. We don't have people parking there and going to the flyer or the bars, or, uh, you know, any other reason to avoid the meters in Balboa. Yes, the people close to the meters do, but why was it drawn at 7th Street to begin with? It was drawn by a small committee of alike individuals that wanted a permit program, and they overdrew it. They drew it at 7th Street when it shouldn't have been dr uh, drawn there. They, in other words, arbitrarily put this into effect, and I have talked against it at time after time at meetings all the way through this process. Have I been listened to? Yes, for my three minutes, and then quietly you just go on. So to say this is not locked in stone, 
really doesn't have any resonance with me. What does is a dagger into our residential area that will allow cheap employee parking in the meters clear up to 8th Street. And that employee parking will now compete with people that buy the expensive residential parking to park at meters, and they'll have to compete with employees in Balboa. Did they ever have to do that in the past? No. Now they will be required to do that. And it will also impact the Newport Harbor Yacht Club because it goes clear to 8th Street. So. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anyone else that would like to speak on this? All right, I'll bring it back to the council. Any further comments to staff that you would like to make? Councilwoman Gardner. Uh, no, I, this is really interesting. I thought all the comments. I, I, I've never been a big proponent of permit parking. Um, I see a lot of issues. I like the, the point that uh, the gentleman made about, hey, when I go park someplace else, I, you know, it's sort of that in every area. I mean, if you talk to people in Corona Del Mar who live near big Corona and say they don't have a parking issue on the weekends and in the summer particularly, I mean, they're parking many times when they come home, several blocks from home, because that's where the only parking is. So it, it's, I see a lot of problems. At the same time, I, I recognize the, the frustration of, of not having a garage. I mean, this does seem sort of unique in this area. So I'm, I'm up in the air. Um, I, did, I do think uh, the mooring uh, issue could use more discussion as well as whether they should get the same or whether there should be uh, a different distinction. So I thought some very good points were, were made. Uh, thank you all for coming. It helped. I didn't help me make a decision, but it at least brought up a lot of points for me. Anyone else? The only other comment that I would add to your comment, uh, Councilman Gardner, is that um, uh, it seems like we've heard often, is this the right area definition? And uh, have we included too much area? Uh, and, uh, and so I think that's something that's still on the table as well. So I, I would make just a couple of comments. Please. Uh, <clears throat> We've, we've really done quite a lot of outreach and had many meetings on this issue and much input from uh, professional consultants on all of this. And, it, and it's, the, the advice has been very consistent along the way about the need for some sort of a residential permit parking program. And the reason is this. We, the, the Balboa Village is different in that it has metered parking throughout, on street as well as in the lots. And strong prospect for intensification of use in Balboa Village. And we do have a problem of spillover right now because people are avoiding metered parking charges and they park in the residential area. That problem will get worse as time goes by and the intensification of the village in increases. And so uh, I think it is a fair question and an open issue about where to draw the line you saw there on that graphic that uh, there was a lot of green. There was a dotted line about two-thirds of the way up on that green. And in response to the issue that Howard Hall brought up and others, we thought, well, let's not start with the whole enchilada here. Let's draw a line tighter in and see how that works. The issue, and I agree with Howard, that more than likely people inside that dotted line toward the west end of it have less of a problem now. The problem that we have, though, is as intensification increases in the village um, and we have uh, permitted parking closer into the village, we'll increase the spillover farther out because people will go a little farther to avoid the parking. And that's why we drew the line where we did. It's arbitrary. And if council has a view that it should be in a different spot, that's fine. I'm comfortable that we drew the line at a reasonable point. I do think uh, the uh, Michelle Silver, uh, who lives on Island Avenue, I think there are a, a, a number of unique issues relating to Island Avenue that aren't necessarily related to this particular point. Um, so I'm okay where the line is, and I realize and I understand why we need to deal with it. I think it's also an open issue about how much we charge for these permits. This is a unique situation here in that 
the intensification of use in Balboa Village will in fact redound to the benefit of the city with increased parking revenue um, as we better manage all of this. And there may be an argument that that's a reason why the permit charge even at only $20 might be something lower or even zero. I, I'm do we, the question of staff, do we we have parking districts elsewhere in the city? Do we charge for that permit to there? Let, let's, Newport Island is an example. What's the permit price for that? It's 15 bucks. 15. Well, you're going to have a parking benefit district. Maybe, I mean, if you wanted to, some of that funding could be used if it became a problem or something. Yeah, I, I my think, point being that we're, we're generating revenue, and we're more likely are going to be generating more revenue once this thing really comes into full swing. And so I've got allowance in my own mind for this issue of how much to be charged. Um, so that uh, now on the issue of mooring, I think this was a good point uh, here. As initially, when we got into this, we had no availability to the mooring holders of parking permit. They made a solid case for why they should get permits. It seems to me, though, that the way to treat them equally is for those mooring holders that have liveaboard permits, I would give them the four permits just like any other land liveaboard, if you will, homeowner in the area. But it probably is worthwhile to draw a distinction in deference to the lady that commented on this, that non-liveaboard mooring owners should probably get f fewer permits, and I would say two permits rather than four. I would think that would be adequate for a non-liveaboard mooring holder. And so that would be a suggested change in relation to that. Otherwise, I think the program, we haven't talked much about the commercial end of it, but I think the program as a whole is a pretty good holistic approach that looks forward to try and address problems as we go down the line. Prime time? Yes, no? Yes, yes, nod. Wake? Nod. I think you got prime time. All right. Public comments. The city provides a yellow sign in card to assist in the preparation of the minutes. The completion of the card is not required in order to address the city council. If the optional sign in card has been completed, it should be placed in the box provided at the podium. The city council of Newport Beach welcomes and encourages community participation. Public comments are invited on items listed on the agenda and non agenda items. Speakers must limit comments to three minutes per person to allow everyone to speak. Written comments are encouraged as well. The city council has a discretion to extend or shorten the time limit on agenda or non agenda agenda items. As a courtesy, please tell, turn cell phones off or set them in silent mode. All right, does anyone like to speak on something not on the agenda or something on the con uh, something uh, during closed door session? Uh, Mary Hill and members of the council, my name is Jim Mosher and I want to speak about neither of those. I have no way to anticipate what you may be announcing at your meeting this evening, but the first thing I, I wanted to call your attention to was that the county has released a schedule for the hearings it plans to hold on the airport settlement agreement, the first of which is tomorrow before the county planning commission. And as you know, the county is considering a number of settlement agreement possibilities, including some with very large airport growth over the next 15 years. And as you know from the response to the recent grand jury report and the report itself, not only the airlines, but there are other forces within Orange County that perhaps aligned with our Visitors Bureau, I don't know, that are lobbying in support of the higher growth options. As of a few hours ago, and despite promises to keep the public informed, I was not able to find anything about this schedule of hearings on our city website. So I would hope that the city staff will receive direction from you to provide strong representation at these county hearings fighting against expansion of the airport. And if there is anything citizens can do to help, I hope that the website will provide guidance as to exactly what we can do to help as well. Second thing I wanted to talk about was the Measure Y, the general plan update that's going on the ballot in November. I personally think Y is a lie. 
but I see that the time for your closed session is very short, so I will save my comment on that for this evening. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to react to a couple of your comments. Uh, number one, Newport Beach and Company, our marketing entity, has not taken, nor will they take, any position to support any kind of expansion at John Wayne. And number two, I have personally signed a letter on behalf of the council and the city making strong recommendations that our desired option be the option that is taken, uh, which uh, is the option that has been negotiated in good faith and signed off on by Airfare, the Airport Working Group, and the city. And I think we'll have more information on that this evening. Is there anyone else that would like to make public comment at this point in time on non-agenda items? Seeing none, we will adjourn for 25 minutes. <laughs>